Hey everyone and welcome to Already Cancelled, I am Peter, that is Connor, and we are going to talk about Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. Which, yes, not a, not a TV episode, we're on the movies, we're on the movies, we did motion picture last time, and now we're doing Wrath of Khan. Uh, the one that is most, probably held, held in the highest esteem, the, the, the praise that seems to get... Yeah. Uh, the reputation seems to be bigger than any other movie, so very curious to see how we feel. Um, did we get spoiler free in the last one? I don't think we did, did we? I don't remember. Oh, it was a few know. weeks ago. We did. We did do spoiler free. We did. Okay. We did. I remember. Uh, so we'll do spoiler free for a bit. I will give you a warning before we go to spoilers, but obviously if you're finding this you know on its own after after you know without having seen anything else we've done we did all the original series we did motion picture so we've, we've done the, the lineage up until now uh, and we're going to dive right in so yeah uh so rather can uh the can from space seed comes comes back he is found uh on on the planet they left him on uh, which has changed a little bit since since then and he comes for revenge on kirk uh, meanwhile, Kirk is, you know, he's an admiral, he's not at command, he's not on a starship, he kind of just happens to be around the Enterprise when things go down, and it leads to a mission, they, they kind of makeshift the team again, almost by happenstance, just because yeah. the situation calls Pe- for people it. People happen to be around. Yes. It's funny how every time there's a, a thing in one of these movies, that's the only ship in the quadrant, so they have to go even though it's not an act of duty. That's two in a row now. The, the way I like to think about it, <laughs> Is that this happens to all the other starships as well? Okay, they're all going. Oh shit, we're the only one nearby. Let's go. So we just we just not seeing those adventures. My 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 diagnosis here would be they have to build more starships. <laughs> Space is a bloody big place. It is, but like. <laughs> Still, I mean, it's meant to be this, you know, this fleet, this fleet of starships, you know. It probably is a fleet if you line them up. <laughs> it's just always the only one in the quadrant. Nothing else is even is closer, every time. Uh, but anyway, so 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 so, Khan is up to no good, and uh, Kirk tries to intervene. Uh, so I'll leave it there for in terms of the, the spoiler-free stuff, and we'll we'll start digging in spoilers into the more details. Um, but this is the first time you'd seen this. Yes. Yes, I had seen it before. I'd seen it once before. I'd, I'd worked my way through the movies yeah, maybe about eight years ago, something like that. So I'd seen them all once about then. And although, interesting experience this time, though, having actually watched the entire original series. I'll, I'll get to some of my, my observations. Things it's, that you felt different this time. Yeah, one thing in particular felt a bit different having actually went through the entire show as opposed I'm to intrigued. having, having yeah. seen a few episodes. But they were the last time I'd watched it. But... um. So the the Kubayashi maneuver, the so the Kubayashi uh, oh. Maru, um, which you know is often brought up. This was obviously the one that invented it, and it was brought up in the two thousand nine movie because obviously that was a actual that was a prequel show. So they actually we saw him do it, we saw Kirk do it, but it's brought up in this because we start off the movie with you know this new cadet, um, uh, Savik, who's a Vulcan played by Christy Alley, uh, a young Christy Alley. Um, and she is commanding the ship, and th- th- she's got Sulu there, she's got Spock, she's got, you know, a lot of the crew that we recognise, and mm. she's presented with this scenario, there's, there's, there's Klingons, there's a neutral zone, there's a, a ship that's in need of aid, and it all kind of goes very badly wrong, it turns out it's a simulation, you know, Kirk steps out and he's got the, the god light behind him, um, and looking all epic and all that. Um, the, one, the one comment I want to make in this, the one critique I want to, ha- I want to say here, is I'm like, okay, it's a simulation, but what, why are Sulu, Chekhov, and McCoy, and Spock all all acting and actually, like, you know, flying around and playing dead? Just for the hell of it. <laughs> because I'm like, you know, it's kind of like uh, if, you're, if you're doing, like, a simulation, like, training exercise, like, with, uh, like, paintball, you know, the, the, maybe police will do with paintball guns. It's not like they play dead, but they'll still talk, they'll still lie there, just kind of bored know. looking. Maybe they, maybe they get into it. <laughs> As, oh. uh, you know, McCoy says, did you not like my performance? You know, he was having fun. Oh, he was having fun, but it's in character for Spock to play dead and actually... Spock just was like, well, I should be dead, so I'm going <laughs> to pretend to be dead. Uphold the standards of the simulation. Because I remember this was a simulation, and I started like, like yeah. why is everyone flying around? Why is there actually explosions going off? <laughs> well, why is simulation... Feel real. Doesn't they feel that real? <laughs> 
Of course it does. <laughs> this is bollocks. <laughs> um, one of the things I said actually in the motion picture is that one, one of my disappointments watching Wrath of Kara for the first time was in the opening titles when it was clear they weren't using the main theme from the last one and they had a new main theme and I was yeah. like, what are you doing? What are you doing? That was a fantastic score. <laughs> Why are you not using it? Um, I still felt that this time, but at least I knew it was coming, so it was it was, it was mitigated somewhat, but I, I was still a little bit, I was like, mm, It's is still a, a good score. Oh, it is. Yeah, it's not bad. Um, there's the 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 uh, the detuned synth stuff, uh, the theremin sound as well. Like it always just just it goes out of tune, not to a like just like out of key. It's just it's just just unnaturally wrong, yeah. and it keeps it does that every so often. Uh, it's really effective. Yeah, James Horner was drinking a lot of booze when he was doing the score, and he just uh, you think that's intentional? It's not. Yeah, yeah his hand just he's he actually on a theremin. His hand just slipped. <laughs> like oh well, that'll do. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. He'll pay me. It's fine. Uh, so, no, it's um, but it's, it's still good music, and, and you know, obviously he's working with cadets. Spock's actually the captain of the Enterprise, but he's he's using it as a training vehicle. He's he's training uh, Savic and other cadets, uh, and I have to imagine that Savic's quite notable because Spock, when he joined up, he was the first Vulcan in Starfleet, right? Was he? I think he was. I'll take your word for it. I feel like that's right. I feel that people can correct me by all means in the comments if I'm, if I'm incorrect with there. Uh, but I feel like he was the first uh, Vulcan in Starfleet, and um, and maybe and you know I mean, the fact that now that there's another one, maybe there's been more in between as well. But you know the fact that well, now we, it's... we know there's definitely been more because uh, in the motion picture, uh, Kirk requested another. Vulcan. That's true. You're right. You're right. There has been more. But you know, the, the point being is that it's more normal now. You know, it's like yeah, oh, this sure. is now an, an ongoing thing. Um, and you know she's asking all these questions, and she's she's debating this 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 simulation, and of course over the course of the film we find out that Kirk beat it. He's the only one who ever beat it, and which is weird because the whole point of it is that it's a no-win scenario. It's almost like a meta joke about the show that he always somehow sit you know saved the day. There's there's a few of those meta jokes. Oh, there is uh, sprinkled throughout. There's a few of them, and yeah. So I mean, before we go any further, I'll just ask the question: Did you enjoy Star Trek Two: The Wrath of Khan? I did, yes. Uh, I mean, what's not to like? By the way, when we did Space Seed, uh, you know, about a year, year and a half ago, whenever that was, when we were at that that point, uh, mm. we got critiques in the comments because they didn't like how we pronounced can because we're not emphasising it in the right way. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's an, ac- it? it's an accent thing, all right? It just, you know, it sounds like we were just saying the word can as opposed to can. You know, you know, yeah, not- I mean... Yeah, I I feel like I'm saying can. So do I. I feel like I'm saying it too, but it, it yeah. sounds a little bit just like they're saying the word can. Well, we can't help that. I can't help that, but you know, yes, it's as good as you get. So just yeah, accept it. <laughs> just there's already comments down there, isn't there? Probably, uh, but I'm acknowledging. I'm acknowledging that some people thought we weren't saying it properly, and I can't do any better. <laughs> this is what you're getting. Uh, but, so yeah, you should hear us say women. <sighs> yeah, women. They're wrong, they're wrong with the way I say women. When, when, when you say it, there is no difference between the singular and plural. <laughs> women? Women. There's a difference there! <laughs> I can just about pick up on the difference because I know what, you know, what to listen for. <laughs> but... Look, I'm so sorry that there's just some vowel sounds that sound quite similar in my, in my dialect, alright? What do you want from me? <laughs> Get a bad dialect? Piss off! At least, hey, hey, many of people are a fan of the Scottish accent. All right, many of people. Yeah, yeah, they are. I don't, I don't get it. I, I understand it. We're sexy. <laughs> <laughs> to to that point, actually, I'm offended. There was some stereotyping going on in this film uh, to to my Scottish persons that I I am not pleased with. Oh, Scotty playing bagpipes. I'm not happy. That's that's authentic. Piss off. Everyone knows that. <laughs> knows what? All Scottish people can play bagpipes? Yeah. It's it's like a natural talent. Everyone's born with the ability. Ah, oh, it's just, just like all, all gingers are born to be dicks. Is, is, that, yeah. is that it? Exactly. Okay. Yes. No. Deeply offended by that vicious stereotype. How dare they? How dare they? So vicious. You can play an instrument. <laughs> There'll be an Irish character on next season who or next next movie who always carries around a pot of gold for no reason. He's just got a pot of gold the entire time. 
Is it liquid and alcoholic? Because if so, <laughs> I buy it. <laughs> If for some reason he's the only one that's got a green shirt on, everyone else wanting around in the yellow, blue, and red, <laughs> he's wanting around green. Green, green looks good on the Irish. What can you say? Uh, honestly, it makes sense if that was the if that was McCoy's color. It's medical. Uh, yeah. After all, you think of it as medical. Green and white, I think you think of as medical more than anything else. Yeah, sure. If I was color coding, that's what I'd I'm done. I'm with you. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, uh, <laughs> what was a tangent. <laughs> So it was, yeah. Bit of a uh, no, Wrath of Khan's very good. Wrath of Khan is... It's funny, because I do actually think there's things I like the motion picture for better, in yeah. some regards. I think motion picture has better visuals and better music. Definitely. And therefore has more spectacle. Uh, but I do think this one has a better character story, has a better villain. Well, has a villain for a start. I mean, motion picture technically doesn't really have a villain in, in, the, no, in the traditional it's sense. It's better paced. It's better paced, yeah. Um, this is definitely the better movie. But yeah, you know, motion picture. It's it's not that much worse. It's not as clear cut as I think the the internet and the the consensus would have you believe. No, like when we get to the scoring at the end, this is going to be higher than what I gave motion picture, but not significantly higher. Hmm. Yeah. So if anyone yeah. happens to remember, you might be able to guess. So. I always remember there been a bit of a plot hole here with the fact that Khan recognises Chekhov, but I didn't remember it being so blatant the way he says, oh, I never forget a face. You are, you know, you are Chekhov. And I'm like, man, he really... Because like, at first it was kind of vague and Chekhov just knows what it... Just, he recognises the ship and he knows who's going to be here. And I, I buy that he just kind of knows that. You know, he's done his research, he knows that this was, this was their ship. You know, his crewmates have told him about it, it's fine. Yeah. But then Khan's all like, I never forget a face. Look, Chekhov. Che- Chekhov was on the Enterprise. He was down in in the decks. He had an encounter with Khan. <laughs> yeah, he's so memorable. There you go. <laughs> it was so memorable. that <laughs> Khan remembers him all these years. Uh, though, although I do love that Kirk is at uh, Kirk. <laughs> Khan. <laughs> I combine Khan and Kirk there into an unholy union, and I don't know yes. what happened. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I loved. It's because they were both in the sentence. This is where I was going with it. I love that Khan is uh, hell bent on revenge with Kirk. Like I, I, lo- I like that. I like that motivation for the villain. Um, yeah. And I, I like, I like how vicious it is. We, we were, we were joking in the last one about how dark it was because of the transporter thing. Um, this, I mean, arguably that moment I think is darker than anything in this. But there's a lot of dark stuff sprinkled throughout this one. Uh, they, I is. mean, there's, there's one point where they fly out find bodies that they're not as brutal as, but it's very similar to how you find victims of the Predator and, and Predator. Mm. That, that said, it is occasionally undercut with Khan having some extremely cheesy lines. Like, even by the standards, they're almost like, you know, like puns. I can't, I can't remember the exact one now. But there was one where he said it and I laughed like out loud at how cheesy it was. I don't recall laughing at a pun. I don't know if it was a pun exactly, or just it was just a it was such a really obvious, blatant line, or something that was really cheesy and cliche, maybe. And I laughed because it just undercut the moment for me. I think Montalban makes it work most of the time, but there was one that was just too far. Because what, what I appreciated is ha- having watched Spacey just last year, is that he immediately felt like the same character again. There was like no no beats were skipped. Yeah. He's just acting like that character, but it's been such a long time. And the fact that 15 years has actually passed, give or take, in real life, you know, between the the episode and the movie, Mm -hmm. it was just, you know, there was a nice, you know, real-time element to it. It was, yeah. uh, It felt like that history was there. Um, And obviously what that means to Kirk and what that means to Khan and and, and all the things going on. So, no, it's very good. Uh, So, Wantabad's very good. Uh, I actually want to point out, uh, so Chekhov's not on the Enterprise. Chekhov's, like, uh, actually the the second in command on another ship. He's uh, with another captain. And I was, it was bugging me. I recognised this captain, the actor. And it was bugging the shit out of me. And it turns out he was the police captain in the Terminator. (laughs) I would never have gotten to that. But as soon as I saw that, I'm like, yeah, that's what that's who he is. He looks different, of course. He has different facial hair. He, you know, yeah, 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 I can um, picture it now. You've said it. Yeah, and I was like, oh, okay, that's cool, that's cool. And obviously, Christy Alley, you know, Cheers, and you know, other yeah. things since then. But that's a, that's the big, big thing. She replaced Diane, <laughs> which was a hard job, but she did okay. Uh, and now we we have Carol, we have David, who are the scientists, because a big part of this plot, of course, is the research space station uh, where they are developing Genesis, and I mean, apparently. 
the Baron was so popular that they had to try and recreate them 200 years in the future. They've got Phil Collins they in a really test have done. <laughs> Just to bring out the drums. I'm not going to lie, as soon as I said Genesis the first time, I'm making a Genesis joke. Of course. <laughs> there's, gonna, there's gonna be a joke i feel like this isn't the first time you've done probably that not here's the problem though is every single song i could think of wasn't actually a genesis song it was a phil collins like on his <laughs> own song so i just had to make a joke about genesis being genesis rather than actually referencing one of the songs i think what i like about this and this is the element that really worked for me more i think this time compared to when i watched it the first time where i'd seen the first movie i'd seen like maybe half the first season but not as much as as you know i know i've seen the whole thing um, it's been, I think you know there may have been a gap as well whereas obviously this time it's been more consistent I've watched the whole show I've went straight into the movies is the whole idea that Kirk has this this ex-girlfriend and I, I don't think it's that much of a spoiler to say that he's got a son here right mm. you know she, she's got a son uh, with him that he, he's stayed away from he's not been in their lives and I think the first time I watched this that felt like just a kind of a convenient plot element right where it just kind of felt like oh we want to create some drama so he's going to have a son I think this time it worked much better for me because the whole idea that he kept making the choice to abandon because the, the, he, he wanted to have a, a wife and a family and that, that life but he always picked being a captain and being being on the Enterprise over it so it worked much better for me this time because he actually did in the past make this choice he act, he he chose to stay away and yeah. that this was going to be his life and even though he has some regrets over that it's still who he is and so it worked better for me this time I think uh, just that plot device that did the first time yeah i don't think i had a problem with it i mean so much of the the original series how many, how many episodes did we have of kirk you know going, going with a woman and then being like nope enterprise comes first yeah exactly so it, it felt more true and it felt it felt more you know uh, no pun intended seeded in the show because mm-hmm. because i'd seen the whole thing now uh whereas on it so it just felt like oh he's got a you know, the son that he is now fully grown. Surprise. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Uh, whereas this time it felt like, okay, no, no, this is actually playing to what the character was on the show. And it makes sense that he would have had, because, I mean, and it would be just before the show as well, because I, I don't know what age the son's supposed to be, but, you know, the, the show was 15 years ago. The son's maybe 25, so it'd be, you know, five, 10 years before the show. Yeah. Something like that. You know, it adds up. You know, it makes it sense. It does. Give or take. So... No, so that, that so that was cool. Um, so yeah, I feel like the, the, there's there's more of a danger. There's more stakes in the fighting because not only does cause does Khan want to actually kill him and and punish him, it just it felt a bit more like you no, know, they're actually out to to kill. Whereas you know in the first movie, Viger is just kind of this entity that is almost neutral. It's doing things out of what it thinks is right, not because it's got a vendetta against whoever's coming towards it or anything yeah. like that. Uh, this was more actual, no, there's a villain who has a personal stake in it. And I think being a sequel to an episode and choosing a villain from that, not only was it a good villain, but picking someone who would have a vendetta built in is kind of neat. It saves you having to go through the effort of creating someone and telling us that we've, we've got this backstory. It's like, no, nah, you've seen it. Absolutely. Here's a, here's a, here's a, a bit of a criticism, though, with, with, with Khan's use in this movie. Other than the fact that he picks up a heavy thing at one point, the fact that he's he's superior genetically is almost irrelevant for the whole film. Yeah, it, it plays in more of his uh, superior mind, you know, with the tactician that he is. Mm. That's very prominent and relevant. Yeah, um, I mean, it's how they explain that they've survived, despite the fact that it should have been really difficult all yeah. these years. But actually, in, the, in terms of actually combating Kirk, outside of, like you say, the tactical side of it, there's no, Very little, yeah. yeah. There's no actual. In fact, they never even they're never even in the same room as each other. They're never actually confronted no. in the same room. It's all over ship to ship and over comms and that kind of thing. No, it's a fair point. And I wonder if it. I wonder if it. You know, that's where they pushed it even more over the edge. Is having a scene where they're in the room together. You know, how 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 do we deal with that? Mm. Uh, kind of thing. Uh, so no, but no, obviously he's, he's very good. Um, and he yes, he does. raises he raises the stakes to all the combat and all the threat. Uh, something that the first one didn't have, and you know, so I'll, I'll get into more of what he actually does, obviously in spoilers. But yeah, yeah, uh, feels feels worth mentioning. Uh, I, I don't think it'll be as much spoiler free stuff in this one because I think with the first one, there was so much talk about okay, the how how is it different from the TV show in terms of sets, in terms of production value. We don't really have to go over that again. No, I just jump so straight much. on, doesn't it? I suppose we have to mention the fact that they've got completely redesigned outfits again. 
but all in red. Which I always wonder if that's a meta joke. It's like, hey, anyone could die. They're all red shirts now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's, there's this wrinkle of them, like uh, when when Kirk's like, "Oh, I'm gonna go down on this mission," uh, and you know, you got going, "Hey, you know, can't you can't be going down without an armed guard." I right, Savik says that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's just you know the, the idea that, and then she's like, "I'll come down with you." Yes. Like, right. Yeah. That's that's the armed guard. We'll we'll send up another high ranking person. Yeah. Well, she's not that high ranking. She's like a lieutenant, though, isn't she? She's like a cadet. I could have sworn she was like referred to as a lieutenant a few times. Maybe I'm misremembering. Yeah, but that's she's still in training. She's not like actually. Yeah. Thing is, yeah, that's why she was taking the test. That's why she's taking the uh, the Kobayashi Maru test. No, I get that. I just they kept calling her a lieutenant, didn't they? Well, well maybe, maybe she was, and she's been fast tracked to lieutenant. That's what she'll be right, when she passes. Right, but that's still higher ranking than others who could be an armed guard. Well, sure. I mean, that's a. I mean, Spock always used to go down with them. He probably shouldn't have it been is. going as well. And <laughs> I think. I think that's part of the joke here is that yeah, okay, yeah. maybe it shouldn't have been that the whole time and throughout the entire show. Yeah, because uh, because the entire movie kind of revolves around that test in many ways because it's all about no win situations. Yeah. And I think that the lesson for Kirk in this movie is that he finally has to lose. He finally has to lose something. Sure, sure. Obviously, by the end of the movie, like the good guys ultimately kind of win, but. There has to be a cost for the first yeah. real time, you know, in, in his history. And even that feels like a meta commentary on the show that he, that never, because it was a TV show, they always had to save the day. And sure, some new characters who were introduced might die by the end of the episode, but it was never. There's no one that really mattered. If anything, it's almost a shame that we have to kind of undo the cost because they couldn't let it stick. And yeah. I won't spoil it, even though it's really obvious given the title of the third one. I'll just I'll be nice and not spoil it yet. But just on the off chance, just on the yeah. off chance. But it's it's almost a shame they had to had to immediately undo it. But it's yeah, I think that's what really worked for me here is that it felt like a deconstruction of all the the TV tropes that were part of yeah. Star Trek, um, and and the right kind of way. Um, uh, it is very focused. It's very much about Kirk's story, and everyone else is kind of. Uh, auxiliary to that uh all, almost to a fault i'd say with uh at least one character who given their ending in the story you would think we'd have spent more time with them yeah throughout the movie uh, yeah so... and again that there are there are meta jokes about this as well mm. like um when kirk and, um, and mccoy and uh, they're going down to, to the planet where they're going to uh spock says hey kirk be careful and mccoy just goes yeah we will uh, you know, the, like the the glaring omission that that Spock directed at Kirk specifically. It's his story. It's he's the one that should be careful, not not anyone else. I never really took that as a meta joke. I took that as a just a joke because <laughs> it really made me laugh. I uh, it's both, uh, uh, to me at least. I, I don't know. I, I I feel like a stretch to me, but I'll take a word for it. <laughs> right. It was a stretch. There was two that really made me laugh from McCoy. Actually, it was that one where he was pissed that Spock only cared about uh, Jim. And then there was earlier on when they're leaving the dock from Earth, and my camera's yeah. shaking because the cats, cats are assaulting the, the place. You can tell. I'm like, oh, I'm going dizzy. No, he's he's uh, scratching his ear right behind the monitor, so the whole thing's just shaking with his leg. <laughs> anyway, uh, so the when, yeah, so they so so supposedly like, Savik, have you ever taken a starship out before? And she's like, no. So like, well, it's a first for everything, you know logical of course it's like, yes logical but she's clearly nervous and uh mccoy's nervous and jim looks nervous because jim's just like he's not again he's not in, he's not in charge yet he's just kind of standing back and observing he's been in the, been, the, been the, the admiral kind of learned a little bit from from the last movie yeah if anything he's, he's learned a lot because he he flat out uh you know because because mccoy comes by for his birthday and he gives him some romulan ale and some glasses and which by the way is someone who's worn glasses since i was five years old it's weird to me in movies and stuff when getting glasses is a sign of old age <laughs> it's just it's been life you know yeah um but yeah he's it, it, very much changed it, mccoy's even like jim you're supposed to be a starship captain even you know he has a scene with spock where spock says Jim, you're supposed to be a star. You should never accepted the promotion. That this is not who you're supposed to be, uh, because Spock's saying, "Okay, now that there's a real problem, you should take over." Yeah, the command. What, what was the phrase used? There being establishing your your best destiny. Uh, your your best possible self or future. Yeah, it was something like that. Yeah, it was it was something along that effect, but it was, it was a nice line. It was a nice line because because Kirk thinks he's going to hurt hurt his ego by taking command, and Spock's like, you know, I'm I don't care. 
<laughs> yeah, it's, it's what you should be doing. If anything, being friends, I actually like you being in charge. But you know, it's when we're working at our best. There's mm. we're a team. But it's, yeah, so so he tells David uh, Savick to take out the the ship, and McCoy just turns to Kirk and says, "Do you want a sedative?" <laughs> and that really made me laugh. <laughs> it was good. Oh dear! I did notice a few stock images or shots from the the last movie though, uh, when they were yeah. leaving. It was like just a yeah. couple of the same effect shots. I was like, I'm not going to be too harsh on you, but <laughs> on, on I critiques, it. I'm going to yeah. get out. In terms of the technical side, my biggest one mm-hmm. was the sound is kind of all over the place in terms of the dialogue recording. Sure, there are points where it's you know, oh, it's immaculately clean, it's perfect, and there's other bits where it's really muffled and it just it's just. Uh, badly recorded it's it's so even in this within the same scene it's hit a miss i wonder if that was to do with um like big group shots and they didn't i don't know maybe it was a i mean it's weird because obviously professional movies deal with this all the time but i'm wondering if it was a case of they didn't they had less time so they couldn't do as many takes to have everyone make so they had to like mm, have someone be. moving their, their boom mic around and that's why some people are slightly off yeah, mic or, or whatever because what one of the big things I learned when I was training to do all this kind of stuff was, you know, like when you're doing a close up of a character in a shot, uh, even if it's like two people talking, the mic's always on the one on camera. You record the other person's audio in their close up, and then you just use the audio from whatever ones yeah. you you know you need, uh, the better one obviously. Um, which is why group scenes have always been a bit of a fickle thing to to shoot. Whenever we were doing student stuff, um, it was hard because you didn't actually have time to do it like a hundred times to get you know a different take with everyone mic'd up. To yeah. get everyone clean, uh, obviously there's a lot of tricks, uh, you know, hiding makes and plants and things like that, as well as some old movies where you, the, the the characters will be standing next to a plant for no reason, but it's because I'm making the plant to pick up the dialogue. Hey, you gotta do what you gotta do. I respect <laughs> it. Uh dear. Uh, I I always love spotting a boom mate peeking out of the shop. By the way, mm, it always makes yeah, me laugh. I do too. It makes me laugh because it's something you obsess about. So it, it, it feel, you feel better that a professional production even sometimes I'll, I'll succumb to it. Although these days I'll just CG it out. But when I'm watching stuff from the 90s and stuff like that, I'm like, yeah, it's a bit, mate. Yeah, yeah. You can't, you can't now, disguise now that. Now can be a little more lenient. They're like, yeah, we'll, we'll get it later. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll just take it out later. It's a d- yeah. Digital world, we're fine. Uh, and that's a, fair, that's a fair complaint. That's a fair complaint. Um, so, is there anything else I want to talk about in spoiler-free territory? I'm just trying to, before we go to spoil, I'm just trying to think about anything else. Uh, worth mentioning. I don't think so. I, I think I think I'm ready for spoilers. Yeah, I think I am too. All right. So as we say, full spoilers. So this is Kirk's story very much. Uh, it's about him accepting that there is such a thing as a, a no one scenario. And when he finally tells, because Savick's like obsessed with it all movie, until they think they're doomed. They've shown up yeah. to the space station. They've come down. You know, it's this uh, McCoy, Kirk, Savick. And they come out of the station, and it's and I actually really like this because it was a darker version of something that happened on the show a few times, where they'd come to like a space station or a or a city, and it'd be like as if something bad had happened and it would be empty. But yeah. here it was like, no, we're going to find bodies hanging up and bloody. Yeah, that was pretty dark. It was it was almost like okay, so here's the th- we had to neuter it for TV and for money reasons, so we're going to do it properly here, and it felt like a hit much harder because of that, and that was kind of neat. And I, I, I love that kind of setup. It's just part of what I love about survival horror is the idea that something bad's happened here and we have to come in and. And it, it did it out. go full horror during these sequences. Yeah. And the, the camera work, the music, everything. Yeah, because McCoy like, backs into the uh, like, you know, hanging body. It's like a proper. Yeah. Sk- you sk- get your stings and everything. Yeah, so I really like that. And, you know, they, they realize that, you know, the you know Carol and, and David have. Of beam down to the planet with Genesis, the Genesis thingamajig, you know the actual Genesis. <laughs> I'll just call it that. And uh, McCann is listening in and all this, and we have this thing where Chekhov and his captain were given these bugs that you know so they can be controlled. So they're trying not to shoot Kirk, but they've been ordered to. And it's actually again, this is really dark. And um, the captain phases himself mm. so he won't do it. Uh, so it's a kind of a noble moment because he's he's saving Kirk, but he's you know it's really dark because he's killing himself, and Chekhov like, resists enough that he he just collapses in pain. Uh, but it's a neat moment because they resist, but they think they're stranded there because Khan's like I'm going to leave you here, you left me down there to rot. Yeah. Think because because they, they they lie and they're talking, you know, Kirk suspecting that he's listening in, 
give Spock a code to to sort of go along with this plan, yeah. and and of course he doesn't tell uh, Savik or anyone else. They all think they're doomed. And Kurt's like, oh, "I want some food. What's, you got food around here?" I, I love Savik's reaction when they get back, and and she's like, "The Spock's like, you lied." He's like, "Yeah, just exaggerated. Yeah, it's fine." Yeah, it's the idea that he he is like you know full circle Spock, where he's learned to kind of embrace some of these tendencies to to win the fights, and she still being like a fresh young Vulcan is like, no, that you lied. We, we're Vulcans. We don't do that. Yeah. Uh, so it's that kind of thing, and it's it's a it's a neat touch to show how much Spock has changed and evolved since the start of the show. But what what I love is that she she brings up the 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 maroon. She's like, hey, like, how did you how did you beat it? And He's like, oh, I reprogrammed the computer <laughs> so that I'd win. Is that like, he cheated? It's like, oh, I don't believe in no one situation. I thought outside the box. I was even commended for it. Commended for being creative. <laughs> um, and it's right after this where you know he just kind of like you know calls Spock. He's like, oh, you're in position. <laughs> and it's like that's it. And she looks like stunned. Like this was all planned. Like he was manipulating them the whole time. Yeah. Uh, and it, it it's it's a really neat. And again, it's showing you that Kirk thinks outside the box. He sets up plans. And he cheats death, and that's kind of what I like about the ending after Spock's death is that when he's talking to his son, he's like, you know, I've never really faced death. I've cheated death a lot. I always think I always treat treat it uh, almost lightly because I, I I've gotten out of it so many times. Yeah. And it, 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 and again, it felt like a very meta commentary on the show. It felt like a, a real reflective idea of what the show had been and what we can do now that we're we're in movies and that we we, we can maybe end some characters because. You know, even if it was another six movies, there'll be six more movies and we're done. You know, we're yeah, not gonna... it, this this does almost feel like a, a finale to the show in in some ways. Kind of, yeah. Um, but I mean, we have to mention, of course, uh, Spock's demise. It's, it's, it's one of the most famous things about this movie, <laughs> and it's and I don't, I don't, you know, I'd forgotten how little build up there was. So there's that scene, of course, where he, he gives command to Kirk at the start, and he says the, the, the few phrases, you know, needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, I uh, forever and always will be your friend. Um, and, uh, and I'd forgotten he said it, I actually forgot he'd said it earlier in the film. I always remembered it from the big scene at the end, but I'd, I'd forgotten that he'd said it up before. And it's basically just a case of the Genesis thing's on the other ship with, with Khan, and he's going to detonate it. And if if, I, if I've got one complaint about Canaan's end, is it, I, I thought it was kind of weird how they start like shooting at the ship, and it's a bit of a game of cat and mouse where they can't see each other in the nebula, yeah. and it's, it's it's a cool sequence. It's really cool with the, the is, ship's yeah. going around. Uh, but I thought it was a bit weird how like you know what what the, his right hand man dies, and he's like I will avenge you, and then we don't really see Can again, and then the next time we see him, he's like half dead, and he's dying. And he's just he's, he's just alive enough to like hit the switches. Feels like there was a scene missing between them. Yeah, it feels like there was a scene missing where he like got got his end like properly. Yeah, I wonder if something was cut for some reason. Yeah, maybe, uh, maybe. Um, but regardless, because he's setting off the bomb, they're trying to get away. But because they've been shot to shit, they have no power, and there's been some malfunctions down in the engineering because of this, where it's just radioactive. They can't go in and fix it. Um, in fact, speaking of dark moments, there's the the cadet who is working because that, that's actually one of the things i like about this is that all the crew are cadets outside of the main people essentially yeah. it's, a, it's a it's a ship filled with people who are inexperienced which gives it a little bit more like oh this is kind of risky like it's not the the experienced crew that we're used you know that that would normally be here hey, you gotta learn on the job right and so i like that but you know one of them dies there's the one that kurt speaks to briefly when he first comes on board uh who gets basically burned alive because he he refused to give up his post to try and help everyone else so I uh, know it, it was dark, a bit more serious. And... There, there were moments where, yeah, you know when uh when when Khan shot out the the, the engines, yeah. and the thing came down, and that guy almost looked like he was gonna get crushed. Yeah, and it was, and there was a, there was a thought went through my head that in in the last movie, they'd have just let him get crushed just to prove a point, just because all you know like, you know like the kind of like the transport scene from from the last movie where it was like, oh, we're doing this because we can. Sure. That was, uh, only, that was the only example of that in the movie, though. Right, right. But this, it felt like here was was almost going to be that moment. And if it was, oh no, there's restraint. It, it felt that way to me. I don't know. I feel, I feel like there's enough dark stuff in this that I don't necessarily feel like... Oh, there is, but there isn't any... Like, that was like, you know, before it was like that body horror, horrific for for no purpose scene. Sure. That's the like Whereas that scene, this though. felt like... It's fine on on its own, just in context. It's it's kind of weird. I still like that scene a lot. I'm I'm okay with it. Yeah. 
No, but so but to go back to the the the, the cadet dying, I what I like about that is he's essentially a red shirt dying, but it's actually far more effective than any red shirt we ever had in the show. It's not. I mean, it's not the most impacting death ever, but it means a little bit. It, there was just enough given to him where he he spoke to him and just hearing that he did this to save everyone else that was down there. It's just enough. Yeah to give a shit about him. And I'm like, man, that's actually more effective than any other red shot we ever had in the show. So, uh, I want to give that props. But, yeah, so so they're on the run, but Spock, realising that Scotty's, like, knocked out or whatever, goes down to engineering and goes into the thing. He even knocks out McCoy to, uh, to, to let him in. And yeah. he goes in, and, you know, they're watching. And they actually won. They saved the day. Kirk just thinks Scotty's got things working. And that's how they could warp away. And it's only when he goes down and, and sees it. And he's like, oh, shit. Oh, no, no. I'll disagree with that. He knows something's wrong. Because cause, uh, McCoy says, you better come down here. And he looks over yeah. at Spock's chair. He knows something's happened okay. to Spock. Um, and I actually love that moment, which is why I specifically correct that. Because I think that moment's fantastic. That he yeah, he's sure. immediately terrified that something bad's happened to Spock. And we see him running. We see him running through the hall and going down. And he is a broken man. When he goes up to that glass and they have to hold him back and then he, he goes up slowly and he, he, he slouches down with Spock. And, you know, we get the lines. We get the, you know, the... the, the. And I'm not going to lie. There was a, tears may have been forming uh, between this and then the funeral scene. There may have been a little mistiness in the eyes. Uh, I think it didn't get me to the same extent because I know it's undone. It doesn't have... To, it just... It, lo- it inherently loses some of its... Even though it's so... It's it's all well done. It's it's all well filmed. It's all well acted. I c- if this had been the end and there was no more, See, I'd have I'd have been the same. I, I, I would... Had you asked me before I watched it if, I, if I'd predicted what I'd feel like, I'd agree with everything you just said because logically, to speak like Spock, that makes sense. However... It didn't matter in the moment. In the moment, the act and the got, music... It got you anyway. It got me anyway. It didn't matter. And it's funny that I'm comparing that to Spock, but it's kind of like, yeah, logically, it shouldn't matter because we know he's just going to be back anyway. But yeah. in the scene, it didn't matter. In the scene, him saying those words and saying it'll always be his friend, and it's like, because cause that's been such a journey for Spock over the course of the show, is admitting that he has these feelings, admitting that he, he is this. Um, and do you know what it was? It, it, part of it is that I'd seen it before, because... When he's doing the funeral scene and they're, they're, they're sending off the, the coffin into space, right? Mm. Uh, the coffin that can withstand re-entry into a planet, just for the record. That's why I point that out. Really well-built coffin. Um, when they're sending him off and Kurt's given his fairly short speech, I knew it was building up to. He was building up to, of all the souls I've ever encountered in all my travels, his was the most human. Yeah. I knew that was coming, but somehow knowing the line was coming actually made it more effective because the build-up to it made it feel sadder. Okay, because interestingly, that's one of the few bits that I've seen before. Yeah. This this ending sequence, um, that I, I, I've studied for, I saw studying for the the music at some point. Um, and so I'd seen it before, and I knew I knew the lines, I knew it was going. Um, and like I say, everything is so well done. It should be getting to me, but in the back of my head, I'm like. Yeah, but it, it doesn't. It's not real, almost. This is just even pro- though it is. This is just proving you have no heart because I know, I know. I knew all this as well. It's not like it's not like you had information I didn't. No, I know. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. And and I agree. I like I, I I wish it got me like it like it did like you clearly. Like I wish it, I wish it worked just that extra bit more, but it and just it just didn't quite. Because watch again. This is probably one of the things that helps better now having watched the whole show. Is I really care about the the the, the bonds between the main characters and. This this final moment of him saying of all the lives he's ever known, his was the most human. Uh, it's such a wonderful sentiment, and it's such a wonderful thing where I I almost wish it cut to McCoy's reaction to that line. I almost wish I saw him, n- yeah. n- n- not in a way where he'd be annoyed or disagree, because I think the point I w- I'd want him to, to say is have him almost like react to it in an emotional way where he kind yeah. of agrees, because because that that would be a perfect capper on their relationship, because he always brings up that he's not human. It would, yeah. In it. Even in even yeah, you know, right before he dies, you yeah. know, he's like you know, he's like, oh no, no human can can withstand this, and then Spock's like, well, as you like to remind me all the time, I'm not. But I think McCoy's saying that is him, kind of without realizing saying that he cares about Spock equally to any human. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, and he doesn't want him to go in there, uh, and you know Spock's going to knock him out with the with the grip. You know he's going to do it. Of course. Yeah. But you know he goes. Um, uh, so. No, it's a, it's a wonderful uh, set of scenes. It's it's funny. It, it, 
it doesn't feel like it's um it, it feels perfect for Kirk's story because it's all about the, the cost that he finally has to pay something dear to win a fight um it's you know finally there was a a, a loss and uh, but it's funny i think in my memory i assumed there was more build up to the you know to, uh, like more of spock building up to it where it, he got more time because it no, was going it, to be his it's end it's why in some ways i'm glad it's not really his end because it kind of mm. feels unfair to, to Spock. have his end be... Yeah, it feels unfair to Spock for his end to be for Kirk's sake, for the sake of Kirk's story. But it is perfect for Kirk's story. It's actually... It's perfect for yeah. Kirk's story. It's just, it's unfair to Spock. Yeah. Yeah, um, so... So, you know... It's, well, it's, it was it's, why it's, it's conflicting, because he's coming it, back, yeah. but at the same time, it kind of diminishes the... The impact. The, the impact of the loss yeah. uh, long does. term. So, it's, you know, it's just kind of 50-50. I think you have to... We get into this fight though. Whenever someone dies in a comic book, we know they're probably coming back. You just feel, or I always, almost always feel just detachment of like, well, who cares? Yeah, I, I think this gets a bit of a pass though compared to that because it's just this one time. In terms of yeah. like you know Spock, in terms of the main characters, it's not like it's not like Spock dies and comes back again later. Yeah, it's not like they were pulling this all throughout the show. And it's not, it's not like it happens to one of the main characters later either, or, or had done before. Mm. Um, the closest would be that episode where McCoy thought he was going to die with illness. But I mean, even then, like... Yeah, but that was about facing his mortality. That was the yeah. point, right? So they get to pass. That's not, oh, I'm dead and I'm back, I'm alive again. Yeah, I, I just, you know, I'm saying that's the closest it got was, yeah. was probably that in terms of the main characters. But yeah, so... No, it's really, it's it's really, uh, it's a really, really well done scene, really well, sweet, really well acted. Definitely. Um, uh, and the, the the famous scenes from the movie for a reason. That that and Kirk obviously screaming "Con!" and then the echo. Yeah. Yeah. So Genesis actually makes a whole new planet. We've not even spoken about what Genesis is yet. It's kind of a big thing to have a look. Yes, Genesis is, but it kind of. I mean, I, th- I think in the most vague way, and this does not do it justice, but in a, the most vague way, it's kind of a terraforming technology. And yeah. I say in a vague way because it doesn't just terraform, it actively takes all of the matter and transforms it into, and, and you know, within minutes uh, can can redo the, an entire planet that's barren into a lush, you know, green world that has full of life and water and all these things. And... At the end of the, the movie, when it explodes, it actually just creates a whole new planet. It's a nice moment. Yeah. Uh, which I believe we just call that planet Genesis now, for the for the sake of... Okay, cool. I think we do. Maybe I'm misremembering that, but... Um, and Spock's sense. Uh, casket uh, lands on it, of course. Um, mm. I, I, I couldn't remember... I always remember it landing there at the end of the movie. I couldn't remember if there was like a hint or something that he was maybe going to come back. Right. But there wasn't. But no. I couldn't remember if there was just because you know. I I, I know what you, what you mean. You kind of almost expected like you kind of will go in. Oh, was it planned? Right. Yeah, I'm not sure how planned it was at the time. I I know because I know that uh, getting Leonard Nimoy back was letting letting him direct was part of convincing him to come back. Yeah. Uh, from what I recall, so. Yeah. So so when when I say you know was it planned, you in your mind you go, was it planned enough? They teased it, whereas. Clearly, I don't, it wasn't. This was intended to be the end. Otherwise, there might have been a moment. Yeah. So, you know, as, as we could say, um, you know, and I, I like all the little bits of Kirk. I, I like him k- kind of accepting because at one point he said he says at the start uh, that no, 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 uh, being being on a, a ship and you know traversing around the galaxy is a, a young person's game, and Uhura and Scott are like. What does he mean by that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Screw you, you old man. <laughs> yeah. And it's you know what's funny about this though, is that, you know, McCoy says to him, like, you know, no, go go and take command again because then do it before you actually do get old. And what what was funny about that watching this now is that like yeah, sure, he was older at the time when he made this, but now William Shatner is still alive, of course, in twenty eighteen, and he's ancient. <laughs> he's you know he's he's like in his eighties, and I'm like by today's comparison, you look you look quite young and spry. It does you are you have no tact? You don't say that. What? It's rude. You can just go. Oh, he's ancient. It's, it's incredibly rude. I to his face. Well, I mean, he might see this. He won't, but he could <laughs> theoretically. Given some of the insensitive shit you've said about people of the past, you're giving me crap for saying someone old is ancient. I know. I just thought it'd be funny. What? 
what? Anyway, the, the point I'm making is, though, is that we're actually at a time now where this, you know, before you really are old, is like, no, now he really is old. Um, yeah. In the movie, yeah, he's older than the show, but he's not that old. Like, you know, he's, he's still a working man's age. Like, he's not... Yeah. That said, he's still not too old because he's, you know, releasing a bloody Christmas album. So, not too old for that. You can do that as... Like... Didn't Leonard Nimoy do an album at some point as well? It might have done. I'm not sure. I'm sure he did. This is a th- I'm going. To, I'm going to Google it right now. You, you may be very well right. Like, I, I, I've never heard of it, but that doesn't mean that he didn't. I just, just, uh, you know, passed by my knowledge. If, if, if it is true. Discography. Was it a... <laughs> oh, he has a discography. Okay, so that's a, that's a pretty good sign. Compilations. Are any of them a Christmas album? Hold on, hold on. Uh, let me just. In December '66, when it became a this is from Wikipedia, by the way, uh, when it became apparent that original Star Trek was developing a strong following in spite of low Nielsen ratings, uh, Dot Records approached the producers of the show. The result was si- the signing of Leonard Nimoy to that label. <laughs> um, blah, blah 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 blah. He recorded a few spoken word albums. Okay. What does that mean? It's uh, you know, there's, there's, it's not singing. It's just you kind of just speak the story over the music. Okay, right. So he's got a few there. The first one's called Space Odyssey. Second one's called Outer Space and Our Mind. So what are you telling me there's no Christmas album? The third one's called Heliological. <laughs> See, these are pretty good titles. Fourth one's called Spaced Out. Well, that's a good one I'm shatting on at this one. Interesting. There's a lot of performed by William Shatner's on that track list. Alright. I knew he'd done some albums. I knew there was a thing. I knew there was... Yeah, yeah. But they're not Christmas albums, so Shatner's winning. <laughs> it feels a bit unfair, you know. If if he'd done it while Leonard Nimoy was still alive, he can compare them. But I mean, it's, it's not like Leonard Nimoy can keep competing now. No, no, but that's life. Hell, if Nimoy was alive, it'd probably be a duo. It'd be like a duet album with with it the two well of them. Be, yeah. <laughs> but then you, but then you can't call it Shatner Claus. <laughs> it feels a bit unfair. Yeah, but you could call it Shanta Claus and uh, <laughs> his his Vulcan elf. I don't know. <laughs> what do you want from me? Oh, I mean, why not? What you want It'll from? do. Um. Yeah. So no, I I I love uh, reactions in this movie, but you know, the first time Can comes on the screen and Kirk sees him and knows yeah. who it is, and he sort of stands up slowly. Uh, really. Even like you know, like uh, Chekhov's reaction to you know when he sees the name of the ship that mm. they're on, he's like, "Oh shit! I know what this is. We've got to get out of it now." Yeah, we got to leave. We got to go right now. It's like, forget everything. Just grab your helmet and let's go. Yeah, um, and Kang is a pretty big scene when he comes with his first entrance when he takes off the mask and he, he monologues for quite a bit. Yeah, I, I actually I think the reveal was a little overdone in the sense that. Oh yeah, we get when they when they run outside, we have the wide shot. There's you know what, fifteen of them all stood there in the the hoods mm-hmm. and everything, and it cuts inside, and uh, Chekhov and the captain are being held, and it's just uh, you know uh, Khan taking off his masks, but everyone else in the room has already got them off. It's just Khan making this big theatrical show about it. Everyone else has already got them off. I feel like it would have been more effective if they'd still had them on. All right, that's a minor quibble, but yeah. Yeah, just stood out to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I... Is there anything else to add? Is there anything else that I add to this? Yeah, it's pretty damn good, isn't it? Uh, yeah. This is a, any other critiques, any other uh, scenes you specifically would like to point out? No, I don't think so. I think we covered all the ones that, that you know, that are stuck in my memory. Yeah. Um. Okay. Star Trek Two: Wrath of Khan. Uh. So I, I. Yeah. No, it's very good. I. I think the 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 higher stakes, the better villain, the more emotional story. That does feel kind of like a conclusion to the the themes of the show, and or at least yeah. the, the not the themes of the show. That's maybe an, inaccurate, but the the progression of some of the characters and what they were on the show. Uh, yeah, I think in terms of the you know Absolutely. the themes of the show, it 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 kind of highlights a lot of the cliches and the tropes, 
and plays with that and it subverts that and it deconstructs it, which is why it works as this ending almost. Yeah, in, in a satisfying way. Whereas The Last Jedi just subverts things at random because no, it doesn't. expectations need to be subverted. <laughs> I'm not getting into it. <laughs> it's not what we're here to talk about. We've done that too many times. Uh, this is the better Last Jedi. Wrath of Khan is a su- superior Last Jedi that The Last Jedi wishes it was. <laughs> Not taking the bait. I actually think the bigger problem in Last Jedi is the pacing and the structure, but you know that's 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 you know, that's, that's a, a lot of conversation for another time. And another conversation that we've already had many times. Yes, yes. Anyway, um, no. So I, I guess we'll I guess we'll rate the film then. Wrath of Khan. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm going eight point five. I'm also going eight point five. Cool, that was easy. Yeah, well, I think I think it is objectively the better film than than the motion picture, but I don't think it's a huge leap that the 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 world would have us believe. I mean, you know, we got some comments in the first one, you know, saying how much they didn't like it, and it's whatever. But um, I I like the first one a lot. If, if if you don't like the first one, it's not that I don't understand it. I I I can see why people wouldn't enjoy it. I kind of feel bad for you that you're missing out on enjoying something like that because I think it's great, kind of great. Yeah, um, but hey, so next time we got uh, Search for Spock, Star Trek 3, and that, that, that's, this one's a bit more in the middle in terms of uh, reception. Um, yeah. it, it's not seen as like a bad one, but I don't think it's seen as, like, it's definitely... It's not particularly good, out of the, from reception. Out of the 2, 3, 4 trilogy, because they're kind of a trilogy, uh, 3 is definitely the weakest link of them from, from uh, my memory, and certainly my taste. Uh, mm. But uh, I'm, I don't remember a whole lot of it to be honest, though. So I'm curious to revisit it. There's definitely some Klingons in it. I know there's some Klingon stuff. Uh, one of whom is played by Christopher Lloyd, if I remember correctly. Uh, oh, so, cool. well, we'll get there in like a week yeah. or so. Yeah, yeah, we'll talk about it next time. So, by all means, let us know what you think of Star Trek Two: Wrath of Khan in the comments. Like and subscribe, all that stuff. Get us on the Twitters at mailed underscore fuzz for channel updates. If you want to support the channel, head over to patreon.com slash mailfuzz TV, and you can do that over there. You get some stuff early. The Star Trek discussions you get a week early, and there's some other stuff kicking around as well. Uh, but have a look. Uh, we always appreciate it. Uh, but otherwise, that's us. Thank you once again for watching and listening. We'll catch you guys next time. Keep watching Star Trek. Goodbye. Thank you.